Hello, um, my name is Kyle Johnson. I'm all those things, minus the wizard ninja. Um, I don't know how you become a wizard. Yeah, anyway. All right, so. <laughs> you just are Kyle. All right, like I said, my name is Kyle Johnson. I work for Saturday Drive. Um, I've, I'm a special projects developer. So the main product for Saturday Drive is Ninja Forms, drag and drop form builder for WordPress. Um, since then, I've, I've worked on a project called Ninja Mail, which is a uh, email solution uh, for, for Ninja Forms. And most recently, I started working on Ninja Shop, uh, which if anyone's familiar with iThemes Exchange, I uh, became Exchange WP. Uh, we've picked up that. So we're doing a rebrand on that e-commerce solution for WordPress. And we're currently iterating uh, to get that out the door. All right. <clears throat> so knowing what you want, a short story. Um, the two people I work with, uh, James and Kevin, um, have a, a background of cowboy coding, and they consider themselves sculptors when it, when it comes to HTML, when it comes to building products. <clears throat> if you ask them what they want, they say, I don't know, go build it, and I'll tell you if it's right or not. Uh, so um, the way we end up building things is, here's this idea. Let's get something started. Let's, it's, let's work on it from there. Um, we found we don't always know what needs to be built, but we have an idea of something we want to try. We try it, and we move on from there. <clears throat> an example of this is uh, when we, um, Ninja Forms recently went through a, a rebuild in a, a version 3 release, uh, which was a, a int uh, introduced breaking changes in the code base, which required re rewriting a lot of the add-ons. So one of the add-ons uh, when I first joined the, uh, the company was to uh, recreate the PayPal Express integration with the, the form builder. Um, I was given the task, I took a week, I planned it out, and they said, here's the features, go do this. And I built it out and said, okay, here it is. Here's how you set it up. I pulled it up on the projector and started, I clicked install, and I clicked the settings screen, and my, my co-worker, Zach, said, this is all wrong. And I was like, well, hang on, just tell me, no, 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 it's all wrong. It shouldn't do this. This is wrong, that's wrong. And I just pulled up the settings screen, and I just stopped talking. I didn't present any more. I didn't actually get through anything the product did or how it worked, because it was, it was all wrong. Um, so went through, took his suggestions, built it again. Came back, and he's like, no, no, this is still wrong. We forgot this other thing. And so I built it yet again for a third time, and now we have a, a much more stable integration. But that introduces pain points of building the wrong thing and taking too much time to do that. And so part of delivering value continuously is focusing on the small pieces and getting the small pieces right in iterations and not expecting to be able to uh, predict the future and, and what you need there. Um, also, um, things change in projects all the time, so it's important to focus on the small pieces, deliver value when you can, because you never know when something's going to change and when you'll need to start over on something. An example of this is um, Chris Edwards uh, gave a talk earlier uh, introducing Google uh, Data Studio. Um, and one thing he mentioned was that he was working on an AdWords piece for a client. And in the middle of his uh, sprint of that project, they rebranded as Google Ads. They rebranded the site, they retooled the site, everything was different. Middle of his project, he'd actually stop and restart and throw, it, and throw all that out, out the door. Whereas, in, in theory at least, if you focus on small iterations, you can see these things work over time and you don't get hit with that one big, oh no, it's all wrong. And so typically what we try to do is focus on the core value of a product and iterate from there. And so thinking of the, 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 uh, focus, the focal point of a product as the core value, the thing that it has to have. Um, I'm reading through uh, Jason Fried's book, uh, the found, one of the founders of Basecamp, his book Rework. Uh, he talks about the focal point of a product and everything outside of that is, uh, is blurry. You don't need to see those details yet because you're not there. So you start with a core value of the product the one thing that the product has to have or it's not that product anymore. So you start with the core value of the product, then you move on to adding edge cases, you start adding new features, um, and then you get into the more specific requirements of what you want the product to become. And so focusing on that core value allows you to quickly deliver value and determine, is this product something you want to deliver? Is this product going in the right direction? And oftentimes, more importantly, does this product need to shift now um, and get ahead of that curve before things change on us. When I talk about core values and, and core value and edge cases, um, one thing I, I'm not saying is putting off things like accessibility or putting things off like tested code. Um, those things are very important. Um, it's not an ex uh, 
delivering value quickly is not an excuse to not be accessible. Delivering value quickly is not an excuse to deliver bad products. These are all things that are still very important. Um, on a side note, when talking about edge cases and the things to factor in, a better term might be stress cases because your users, your customers aren't, you don't want to think about them on the edge of your product, but they might be stressing the limits or trying to do something that's, that's not necessarily provided now that you want to get to. Um, but those things are very much important to consider. And doing something quickly is not an excuse to do something poorly, um, is oftentimes the example we see with Silicon Valley. Um, one term that gets thrown around, gets thrown around a lot is uh, agile software development. Uh, there is the agile capital A methodology. There's also the agile lowercase a um, software manifesto, doing things quickly, iterations, focusing on small pieces, getting things done, and delivering value. Um, a little story on agile development and when it was introduced. Uh, Lockheed Martin had put in, um, had budgeted for a product, a project. They put in millions of dollars. Um, software project, they brought in this huge team and they, they gave it a, a time budget and a money budget. Um, it was X number of years and Y number of, of millions of dollars. And they got to the deadline, it wasn't done. They pushed it back, pushed it back, pushed it back and never got the project finished. And so one of the proponents of Agile back in the day came in and said, uh, we're gonna fix this for you. Brought him in to fix the project. He looked at the project and said, okay, well we'll do it in half the time of the original um, budget. And we'll do it for half the, um, the cost of the original project. Not only that, we'll do it with a half of the original size of the team in the project. And they laughed at him, said you can't do it. But using an agile methodology, he's able to deliver small pieces quickly over and over and over again and actually get the project done under time, under budget with a smaller crew. Uh, likewise, uh, there's a story of working uh, on a government project uh, to where they had hired typical, a uh, typical development team with a waterfall development cycle to where they try to plan everything up front and it just takes forever and nothing ever really gets done in time. And so the way this, the new agency came in and, and said, um, here's the budget for the project, here's what we think it will cost, how long we'll think it will take, um, but we'll make a deal with you. We'll deliver every other week, we'll meet on Friday, show you what we've done so far, and if at any point in time you think we've done enough and you're happy with what we've delivered then, um, if you, you can buy out the contract at half of the, recurring, of the remaining cost. So you actually, we'll, we'll get it done faster and we'll get it under budget. And of course they say, that's ridiculous, not gonna work, um, but hey, there's a chance, let's try it. And so they actually deliver the project within a number of months, not years, for a fraction of the original cost. But the development team is able to get it done, get their work done faster, and actually make more money by doing th things quickly, as opposed to wasting years of their time building something they could have done previously and just kind of dragging it along. Uh, speaking of agile, um, part of the agile manifesto of, of the way um, these developers write software is that the highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Uh, the key word there, although not in bold, would be valuable is because if you're not deli delivering valuable products, then you're focusing on the wrong thing. Um, on that note, delivery, um, the customer can also be a stakeholder. Um, delivering doesn't necessarily mean publishing live. It can be showing to the, the person who's in charge of making that final decision. Uh, could be the boss, stakeholders on a project. It can all be internal. And you can also you can continue to deliver value internally even if you're doing a big launch down the road. Um, Another, another piece of the Agile Manifesto is responding to change over following a plan. Um, not to say that plans um, are not important, but responding, in change, responding to change in terms of Agile development is more important than the plan itself. Spike and stabilize. Um, when looking through um, how to build uh, software f faster, better, came across um, a talk by uh, Dan North uh, he gave a, a talk at the GoTo conference entitled Software Faster, and he talks about methodologies for, for building software faster, and one of those methodologies he introduces, uh, he calls Spike and Stabilize. He tells a story of a, 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 a team of developers, uh, a four-person product team, uh, who works really well together and does the work of 40-person software teams. Um, and when working on a project, they had a bunch of stakeholders in a room and they're trying to, there's this idea of thing they, this thing they want to build and they're all sitting in a room ha trying to hash it out, trying to build a master plan. And so he steps out of the room and pulls up his laptop and he starts um, just kind of um, building an idea of what it would look like and, and starts uh, doing that kind of demo. And so he brings it back to the stakeholders 
um, by, by the end of the day, and they're still like halfway through their meeting, and everyone wanting to go home, and they don't, they can't decide on the button colors and how things were arranged. He said, "How about this?" and pushed his laptop forward, and actually had a working demo of the, the first round of what they were wanting to build. So, being able, sitting down and focusing on delivering that value as opposed to hashing out a master plan, he was able to deliver something literally by the end of the day. Um, whereas a team of people, a committee of people, um, were still in the middle of a planning meeting that was going to go on forever. Uh, oftentimes, with, when, with building materials, we talk about measure twice, cut once. But a big part of this is because when you're working with a physical medium, those materials are limited. If you, if you measure a board and cut it wrong, you have to buy another board and then recut it and hope you get it right the next time. But with software, oftentimes we can measure once and cut it again and again and again and again because with software, it's not as limited of a resource, and we can literally iterate and try things, try something, scrap it, try something, scrap it, and the um, financial overhead is a lot uh, lower in those materials. So in terms of software, oftentimes we find we can measure once, cut again, again, and again, but then remeasure and see if we're on track. We don't have to be limited to uh, the building material, say, of, of woodworking there. All right, so oftentimes when talking about uh, Delivering value, um, there's often, I've oftentimes come across uh, this image in my research, the concept of the minimal viable product. And so, if you're, the example in this illustration is you're, if, if someone's ordering a car um, and they want, and you want to build in pieces, you don't start by giving them a tire and then a chassis and say, "Hey, here's the chassis." No, your car's not ready yet, but look, hey, we made a chassis. Um, and then trying to build a body and then add the engine and doors. And then finally there's a product. Every piece of that step while delivering is not usable. And so with, with the concept of, of delivering a car, while this exact use case isn't necessarily real world, if your goal is not the car but transportation, the first iteration of transportation could be a skateboard, then it could be a little push scooter, then a bicycle, and you're getting up to that um, traveling faster, um, farther distances with lower resources, lower amounts of energy. So if the goal in the end is quick transportation for long distances, then you end up at the car, but you might start out with something like a skateboard to see if that's, a, if that's actually the goal they're wanting to achieve. Um, I've also, I think a better example of this kind of delivering value um, we see in, in comic books and illustrations, uh, Disney animated films, storyboarding kind of a thing. And so when you work on laying out a comic book page, uh, you typically start with layouts and thumbnails. And it's, it's very fuzzy, it's a very um, low fidelity, you can't really make out the details, there's no, not necessarily facial expressions, but you're sizing the frames, the characters, and the, and the scene to fit the page. And then the illustrator works with the author to see if that's what they're wanting. So you start with pencil sketches, and they say, no, that's not quite right, we need to rearrange this. If you're doing full inked and colored pages, and then finding out the layout's wrong, you have to scrap all that work that's now wasted. But in the, in the case of comic books, to continuously deliver value, you start with layouts and thumbnails, and you get that right. Once that's right, you then move on uh, to pencils with a higher fidelity, facial expressions, um, to communicate interactions between characters. And from there, you ink it once the pencils are right. And once you ink it, only then do you start adding color to really finalize that product and get the full value of the product um, through all that work. And so um, a bad example of how I've tried to deliver value uh, was with the, uh, when we did the, the relaunch of Ninja Forms as version three, um, it was a year long rewrite that we expected to take a few months. Um, and we, didn't, we weren't focused on how we deliver the value, value quickly. We had this grand plan of how to rewrite this thing. I'm very proud of where we got with the products. It is, is very stable now. Uh, but in the beginning, it took way longer than we anticipated because we weren't focused on what we were wanting to really improve with it. We had this previous version of the plugin, all these features, and we put it on ourselves to build all those features into this product out the gate. And we told ourselves, it can't release until all this is out there. And a two, three month build ends up taking us a year or more to get all those features in there when we could deliver value within the first month of the new uh, builder user, uh, user interface, um, the, the new builder user experience, but instead we limit ourselves to requiring all those extra features that weren't necessary at first. If, had we started with the smaller pieces, we could have iterated around that idea faster and gotten to a better user experience sooner and not had to wait for uh, user feedback after everything is delivered. Um, 
A better example would be maybe some of the ways Gutenberg's delivering right now to where they have the beta feature, the beta plugin, and they, they build and release, and then user testing, they build and release. They have a long-term goal they're getting to, but they're not trying to hide some pieces. They're not intentionally trying to hide all of Gutenberg and then one day say, hey, version 5, look at this new thing you didn't know about. So they're, they're releasing over time. And so um, in the recent year, um, I have some better examples of how uh, particularly my, uh, the team I work with has, has delivered value um, more quickly. One of those examples with forms is the add-on manager. And so we identified the pain point of the add-on model being that you would have to make a purchase, you would then have to go to the downloads page, download the zip file, copy the license key, go over to your client site, upload the file, paste your license key, activate. You need to do that for every single site. And so we identified that pain point. We um, tried, we put together some brainstorming how we want to solve that, and we started um, iterating from there. What resulted was a, a one-month turnaround beta of our add-on manager, which is a one-click installation of add-ons. We make the purchase, you click install, it installs the, the add-on remotely. There's no downloads, there's no license keys. It all happens seamlessly. And with that, we started out with uh, using easy digital downloads to sell the product. We first said, okay, if this is an add-on manager, the key feature here is remotely delivering these add-on plugin files. So how do we do that? So I went to my office, I did some research, I built a thing that you could hit an endpoint and it remotely delivers that file. It doesn't authenticate, it doesn't copy license keys, it doesn't activate anything, it installs it in WordPress. And I said, okay team, here's this, here's this URL, that delivers, Is this, am I still on track? They said, yeah, that looks great, keep going. From there, I add in the um, authentication, so do we have this purchase made? And said, okay, here's how this workflow is. You uh, go to the site, you click here. Um, if you're then authenticated, it installs it. Okay, it looks great. Then I add in license keys. Okay, we install it as license key, so now um, automatic updates also work with the system. And, and we keep adding features, adding features, so that um, we always had something core that worked. Every time I delivered, we had something working that we could stand on, and I could present it to the team and say, am I on track? Is this the thing we want to do? We didn't necessarily release publicly every step of that feature, but we did have a solid beta to release that was relatively stable, um, minus like hosting conflicts. Um, and so we're able to get that turnaround really quickly. Had we focused too much on the details up front, we would have not realized all the hosting conflicts were after the fact, and we would have decided ourselves that we have this thing working, it's perfect, and launched live to a million plus active um, installs on WordPress. And then we would have found out about hosting issues. And then we've had a million people submitting support tickets because there is some security feature on this host that this host doesn't have and it blocks downloads. And by focusing on getting that delivery uh, right and then testing on other hosts, we can say early on, here are the blockers. If the core feature is remote delivery and that doesn't work on hosts that support WordPress, it doesn't matter how we authenticate, it doesn't matter how we handle license keys, it doesn't matter how we do logging in the background. If that doesn't work, the product doesn't work. So focusing on that early on allows us to find those barriers, get over them now, and then we can build the product out from there. Um, more recently um, is the Ninja Mail product we, we built uh, to solve email issues um, in, in form, notifications, um, things like that. And so the idea there was how do we do something quickly? And so we were able to launch a new service within one month's time. We had, had not built a service, we hadn't necessarily um, done a whole lot with the OAuth authentication and all that, the API connections. So we started out with, I built an endpoint on a staging site that says, you send data to this URL, it sends an email. And went to the team and said, okay, I have this set up, here's, it's integrates with our transactional email provider, when you hit this URL, it sends the email. And then I said, okay, now here's um, Ninja Forms submitting a form, hits the API, API endpoint, and delivers the email. At that point in time, the product team for uh, Ninja Forms said, okay, that looks good, but we're off on this piece because it doesn't integrate with the form quite properly. And we're able to identify that now before we make too many decisions down the road that make that more difficult. So identifying those core um, functionality issues up front, we're able to then build on a more solid platform, which results in a one month turnaround, um, as opposed to multiple months where we then release it, then find these issues after the fact. Um, there's particularly a lot of stakeholders because where's the, there's the, owners of the company, there's the um, Ninja Forms team, the support team. Support teams have to be able to support the product, and if they don't get eyes on it early, then we're gonna build something in our own direction that they have a hard time supporting. And integrating um, them into that process 
ultimately build a better tool. And so once we launched it, it wasn't as robust as we wanted it to be, so we then added more features on there. Uh, one of those things was a, a debugging tool that we, we, we didn't realize how it needed to work, how, um, how we needed it at the time. And so we built it, launched it, we got some report requests in, we realized here's where these problems are in these people's websites. Here's how we introduced this new feature, we built it, we released it, and we spent maybe two more days on it. Um, and we didn't try to get all it up front because we don't necessarily know what all those hurdles are going to be. But we delivered an API integration for delivering or for um, re trans transactional email through Ninja Forms in a very quick manner. Allowed us allowed us to then get user feedback on how the product works, so we can then make it better. And so now we're finally at the point, um, one month after that initial launch, of it being. Um, a, a, a very stable product at this point in time. We've identified the, the key um, or the, the most frequent possible issues. Uh, we can educate support team on how these things might go wrong and how we address it as a team. And um, we're able to make those iterations uh, very quickly. Um, I'm continuing to use this, this kind of uh, quick deliverability. Um, and, and as an example, uh, we're talking with some people at one of the previous talks. Um, about the, we're talking about photography and stock photos, and I had the idea of what if there's a community-driven stock photo site where WordPress uh, community photographers could take photos, upload them to a site, and then WordPress bloggers can then uh, pull those into their site. So Unsplash has that integration they showed off. Um, maybe even Jacob's talk where he showed that, where you can drag and drop stock photos into your site. But one of the problems with stock photography is that um, however we talk, how much we talk about trying to kill stock photos or death of stock photos as a service name, which really just a stock photo service. Uh, they're trying to disrupt an industry, but really they're just trying to replace it with themselves, a lot like Uber and taxis and Airbnb and hotels. They're recreating the same thing over and over again. Um, instead, uh, so the problem with stock photography is really the same photos over and over again, no matter what service you use. And so the idea was, what if they were unique photos? Community members take photos, upload them, they're claimed one by one, well, on one-on-one -on -one relationship from bloggers, so they're unique. And so I think it's interesting, but before investing a lot of money in a potential platform or service, what do other people think? But the problem with telling people, giving people ideas, like what do you think about this idea, they don't always see it the way you see it, and they might be interested, but there's nothing to show them. And so in between talks, before this talk, while eating the fancy popsicle outside, um, very good gourmet popsicles in town, um, I, I sat down and I put together a first iteration of what that would look like. And so I have on a demo site now, locally at least, um, a system where you can put in a photo title, upload a photo, post it, um, and it creates a, a custom post. It attaches the photo as the featured image, displays it on the front, and then redirects you to that page. So I now have a system to where uh, photographers can upload photos to a community site, so then people can go and start downloading them. And so the core functionality of that, at least to start, is the ability to upload photos in a way that's um, publicly viewable. And so now I have that working, I can go to photographers in the WordPress community and say, here's my idea, here's how this works, here's how you can take a photo and upload it for use by the community. And then from there I can work on how do we limit one-to-one -one downloads or someone will point out, hey, it'd be, these would be more usable if they were, had tags in them, if you could tag the photo. And so, okay, I can do that. I can integrate adding tags to the photo at the time of the upload but it doesn't necessarily affect the core functionality of uploading the photo that's in publicly viewable. So I can iterate that on that over time. And then I can add in functionality of like, what if they're one-to-one? -one? And how do we do potential reimbursements for community members? Are they all free? Or maybe we do some kind of like micropayment option. But if you start dreaming too much up front, all the possibilities, you can get weighed down on what you can do and then not build anything of use. Um, and so if I were, I think the interesting idea is adding like credits and one-to-one -one downloads, but you don't build that first because the value's not there. Someone else has that value, but the value here is a community-driven uh, photo uploading site. And so if I start with how do I do payments and where do I integrate and how do bank accounts uh, connect and how do you transfer funds, then you're not actually focused on the core value of the product that, that you can then iterate on and show people. So if I talk about this idea of community photo blog, and then show them like a micropayment service, that doesn't mean anything to them and have actually missed the point of the, the core feature there. Um, so, um, yeah, so over the past few years, I've been trying to build these new products, a lot of new products recently. Um, and I've found this deliver, uh, potentially delivering the value quickly has been very beneficial. It's, it's kept me on track. Um, it's kept me delivering the things I need to be. It's keeping me focused on features that are important. And probably most importantly, it keeps me off the features that aren't important. 
Um, most recently working on the Ninja Shop project. There's a lot of features we need to add before we can release it publicly in this full-fledged idea we have. Um, but in thinking about all those ideas, there's too many things to, if you try to think of all the possible features at once, you, personally at least, I get um, overburdened with all the possibilities. And so I started building this feature here, but then I was like, got an idea for another feature, I wanted to be here, started building that feature. Then I realized I had spent like two days of dev time and had nothing to show for it. So I said, I know what to do here, focus on value, what's the most important thing, this feature, I built this out. Then by lunch that day, I said, hey boss, here's how this works, what do you think? This is what we got working for the base of iterating on this project. And so I went from spending two days of dev time with nothing to show for it, to by lunch had something to actually show. Um, which I think is um, um, very valuable for internally releasing a project, but also when you get into delivering products publicly, your customers get more value out of the product uh, sooner from there. And um, that's all I have. Um, if anyone has any, has any questions, um, I'm, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Uh, this is a team, photo of the Ninja Forms team after a year-long release of three. I don't normally, we don't normally jump in the air and scream and celebrate, but when you spend that long doing something, you have to be excited about it, all that nervous energy. So ideally, um, you should be able to iterate faster and not necessarily have this much excitement when you deliver value. So uh, that's all I have. I uh, appreciate you being here. Give me a chance to speak with you all today. If you have any questions, I'll be around.